Which one do you want to do first? How about Messier 39? Messier 39. All right. Yeah. I haven't done any homework, Professor. I don't even know what Messier 39 is. <laughs> Messier 39 is an open cluster in the constellation of Cygnus. We're doing it mainly because I thought it'd be nice to actually get a picture of my own of one of these objects to illustrate our chat. And the night I went out to do this, the clouds were rolling in. It was a really grotty night and I had to pick a bit of the sky where there was still a little bit of clear sky that I could actually look at. And also I wanted something that was kind of unchallenging to look at because I knew I only had a couple of minutes before the clouds rolled in. I'll use your picture, Professor, but you won't be offended if I also use some professional ones. Please do, although you'll, I think you'll be hard-pressed to find an exciting picture of M39. I mean, I'm sure everyone by now knows what an open cluster is. Yeah, so there's these two types of cluster. There's the globular clusters, which are these beautiful round things, generally very old. And then there are the open clusters, which are generally somewhat messier collections of stars, generally a bit younger. And they tend to be in the plane of the Milky Way, whereas the globular clusters are kind of in a big halo around the Milky Way. There is a gravitationally bound component of an open cluster. Ultimately, they will all diffuse away. And so, yeah, Messier 39 is just one of those in its relatively early stages. It's a few hundred million years old. So these are sort of like stellar childhood friends having their youth together before they go and have their lives out in the Milky Way. Absolutely. And they have lots of things in common, which it turns out to be quite useful. They have similar stellar properties, but also they're kind of moving together because there is bound cluster of stars. Part of the reason why this cluster doesn't look very exciting in the picture that I took and actually in lots of other pictures is because it's enormous. It's actually about half a degree across. So it's about the same size as the full moon. But there's probably only about 40 or 50 stars associated with the cluster. And in fact, even if you want to see there's a cluster there at all, what I ended up having to do was kind of move the telescope off to show that there are fewer stars a little bit to the left and a fewer stars a little bit to the right, but a few more when you're actually pointing at the cluster itself. It's actually very nearby. It's only about a thousand light years away. So in the grand scheme of things, it's one of our closer neighbors of these open clusters, which means it, it ends up looking pretty big on the sky. The interesting result that came out, I'll show you the paper here. It's a paper entitled Extended Stellar Systems in the Solar Neighbourhood 5, Discovery of Coronae of Nearby Star Clusters. Discovery of Coronae? Yep. So the new resource we have to play with are the results from the Gaia satellite, which has been measuring the positions of literally billions of stars with incredible accuracy. And so what they were able to do is survey the Gaia stars in the region of Messier 39. Actually, they did a few other clusters as well. And they can pick out those stars which seem to be moving the same way. So remember, Gaia, not only does it tell you where the stars are now and actually how far away they are from this technique called parallax, but it actually also measures this thing called their proper motion, which is how they're moving on the sky. So they were able to survey this region and find all the stars that are moving in the same direction as M39. But it turns out even that, because it's such a big bit of sky you're looking at, that's not a trivial thing to do. Because, for example, if you imagine, supposing you were watching a train passing, so you're standing next to the train tracks and you're watching a train passing, actually the bits of the train that are closest to you move faster, at least in terms of the angle as they move across, than the ends of the train, because the ends of the train are further away. So even though the, the ends in the middle are all moving at the same actual speed, the apparent speed of the bit in the middle is higher than the bits at the end. So they have exactly the same problem here, that they actually have to be able to take out that effect to actually say, okay, so we, you know, we need to, we actually expect the bits closest to the middle to be moving a bit further faster than the bits towards the end and so on. So they use some rather clever techniques to take all that out to try and figure out which stars seem to be moving along with M39. Then they use the fact that they, you have this parallax information which actually gives you the distance to those stars. And so that distance then says, okay, and these are the ones that are actually likely to be in this cluster because they are at the right distance away. By doing all that, they were actually able to identify hundreds of stars. Remember, there are about, as I say, 30, 40 stars maybe that we can actually see in the cluster. They detected 350 stars that were originally part of this cluster that are all moving together. And it's now this enormous structure. Right? Remember I said the cluster itself is half a degree across. That's about the size of the full moon. That's already very big in astronomical terms in terms of coverage of the sky. The whole thing is like 20 degrees across. Oh. So it's a huge bit of the sky that this thing is covering. It's really exciting to sort of capture this happening. It is. The way you kind of say whether something's in the cluster or outside it is whether it's beyond the tidal radius, which is basically saying, is it still bound to the cluster or is it now kind of escaped and is part of the Milky Way? Most of these stars are beyond that tidal radius. So they've actually already escaped and are really starting to mix into the Milky Way. But they just remember that they were members of the cluster. So they were all still traveling in vaguely the same direction. The amazing thing is now they're looking at the stars that are a long way away from where M39 is now. You might say, well, how many of them are likely to be, you know, contamination or other can they really tell if they're still cluster members from the tests they've done 
they can get down to a point where only one in a thousand of the stars they're looking at is still a cluster member and they can still say it's that one. What's the corona part of the title of the paper then? What's that referring to? I mean, in terms of when you're thinking about the sun, for example, we talk about the sun and then it has this corona of very diffuse gas around it. And it's Mm. just really by analogy with that. They're talking about the cluster and then there's the corona of the cluster, which is this diffuse little bits and pieces of the cluster around it. Professor, you know one of my holy grails, and I ask you about it all the time, is the cluster that the sun was born in. This makes me think about that. This makes me think we're starting to develop the research methods that may one day lead to us pinpointing where the sun came from. I think the problem with the sun is, I mean, so these things are already spread out over, you know, tens of degrees across the sky. The problem is the sun went through this process so long ago that all its friends now are kind of spread throughout the Milky Way. So we really aren't going to be able to reconstruct where they all came from from this kind of method. Uh, I'm never going to give up. (laughs) They did this for about 10 clusters they've looked at, and actually all of them show the same kind of thing, right? That there's this this sort of central cluster, but there are these diffuse coroni. And again, they've all been stretched out in the same way by these tidal effects. And they produce this beautiful 3D toy that you can play around with. You can actually look at the data and visualize it in 3D, move it around. Um, So you can actually really see these three-dimensional structures that these clusters of stars are getting stretched out into. And actually, one last thing to say is that there's a neat trick that they can do to just convince themselves they're not being fooled by this, which is once they've detected which things they think are the members of the cluster, then they can construct one of these things called a colour magnitude diagram for them, which we've talked about quite a lot of times before. The important thing about them is for any given cluster of stars, the stars only fall in very particular sequences in these colour magnitude diagrams, whereas if you were just picking random stars, they tend to be scattered around all over the place. If they then construct one of these colour magnitude diagrams for all the stars they've extracted, they lie beautifully on on the sequences you'd expect for the M39 cluster so that they know they really have found the stars that originated in M39. Professor, if we rewound the clock and had a look at this cluster a long time ago when it was a lot newer and all these stars were closer to each other, would it still have the appearance of an open cluster? I mean, it's not going to be a globular cluster, is it? I mean, what, what's it going to look like if we went right back to, you know, near the beginning? If you go right back to near the beginning, you'll actually probably just see the cloud of gas from which it formed because the stars would all be embedded within that cloud. So you'd have one of these things called a giant molecular cloud. And because there's a lot of dust associated with that gas, you probably might not even be able to see the stars at all. It's only when that gas kind of finally diffuses away and takes the dust with it that the star cluster will magically appear within the residuals of that gas cloud. But presumably when the gas fight, when the shroud finally lifts, it's quite dense with stars. It's not the it's not the diffuse cluster we see now. I mean, so there are younger clusters like the Pleiades where we're just seeing them starting to emerge and you can actually still see some of that gas in that you see the reflected light from the stars. And indeed, they are that bit more concentrated, but they're still not the same sort of spherical, beautiful structures that you see for the globular clusters. They're always a bit messy in appearance. Nice. As you can see, there are two horizons. And I don't know if I can visualize it, I can try. So you can see, I'm looking for two, there are two horizons in there. There's one when the tow 